Hello, humans. I have been asked to write this as part of our diplomatic relations. A written account of how we engaged in first contact and the circumstances leading up to it. My name is Krakaneld V, High Counselor of the Diplomatic Corps. I'll be speaking for the Eridian peoples and the Eridian Confederacy as such. It is a pleasure to meet you. Whoever thought humans were so... cute? I'm sorry, I digress. I do that a lot when I am excited. I shall not waver any further, if I can help it. First, some introductions. I hear we are not the first species that humanity has encountered, but the first to actually still be around to tell the tale. We are well aware you are not responsible for their extinctions, so we will hold off on that topic for another day, or figure it out ourselves. For the record, we are described by the few humans we have met so far, as eight feet tall blue skinned space elf vampires. Whatever that means, I am certain we will figure it out eventually. We are, however, not violent at all. The kick in the head you so valiantly gave to us on that fateful day more than made sure of that. As you humans refer to it, a kick in the head with a steel toe boot, to the face, in our case, repeatedly. Never has my entire species or civilization been so ridiculed and humiliated, berated and abused on such a massive scale by sheer words alone. Not one shot was ever fired, but that day, you broke us. But it... it was what we needed. It was the fire up the pants we deserved, the stark reminder we needed to snap us out of a downward spiral. A spiral it was. Although we have only just begun implementing your concept of the free press and independent media, mostly all media is still state-run, although now with severe restrictions on publishing ability, especially revolving around certain political matters. Simply put, it is now, within our circles at least, against the law, punishable by death in fact, to publish lies that threaten the stability of the nation. Media outlets, even though were state-owned, had hidden agendas of their own, and underground news networks are filtering division and sedition for the public. Manipulation of markets by unaccountable individuals led to mass inflation. Warmongering from politicians and hidden figures resulted in stockpiling fusion weapons. It was a complete bastarding mess. We didn't have the pollution or ecological failure humans apparently had, so we were spared that humiliation at least. Now, on to what exactly happened. It started shortly after the election of our National Chancellor. In comparison, a Chancellor has slightly more power than a President, not like a King, but close enough to one, and one voted into power by the people. Of course, we don't have the checks and balances like Congress, Parliament, or the courts to get in the way. There is instead a High Council that serves all three roles instead. I digress, sorry. Our first encounter, first contact if you will, occurred just after the election of High Chancellor Gregorian Valtair. Just after His Highness's internment to the office, in fact, Gregorian Valtair, or Greg, as the Corsair, I think, kept calling him, Corsairs, that is a concept we will have to ask you about when this is all done, but for now we will continue. Greg sat at his desk in front of the High Council and began his internment speech only to be immediately interrupted by a Praetorian, our equivalent of Secret Service, interrupting proceedings and raising the alarm. He barged in, stood in front of the High Council and exclaimed, Aliens! There's a warship in orbit of Alara! Everyone was more irritated at the interruption, rather than the sudden exclamation of an alien warship in orbit of our moon. What insolence is this behaviour? What warship? Look out the window, you old twats! The Praetorian nally exclaimed, then dragged the High Chancellor to the window, not necessarily gently. The Chancellor took one look at the massive seven kilometre long warship, casually perched in full view within our moon's gravity well. Oh shit! The Praetorian grabbed the High Chancellor again and stared him straight in the eye. What do we do now? Are we screwed? Should I get the white rot? Everyone in the room, myself included, cringed in pain at the mention of a rather potent form of liquor that backwater peasantry drinks when they, uh, 
don't want to live very much longer. Uh, I will elaborate on that at a later date. We immediately scrambled to secure bunkers and prepared our people for what we believed was an invasion. We spent three weeks ready for an attack. That never came. The warship just sat there, staring at us. Eventually we let our guard down, and allowed a moment of air, so to speak, as we rallied our Minister of Technology and Minister of Diplomacy, myself, to start working on a way to contact the vessel. At least we could find out what it was actually up to before we started panicking. Again. We started simply by trying varying radio frequencies. There were thousands to go through, and back then, our level of technology was similar to that of your year of 1974. So, not very advanced, and we had a lot of work to do. So many channels. So many signals. At first. We found it hard to interpret radio frequencies, we did find. Some of which apparently were, but for some reason we couldn't really... filter it. Until by lucky happenstance, we sent the signal we did find for a television set. Yes, we actually did have those. Moving picture machines and video technology isn't all that dissimilar, it's just photons after all. You're not the first to figure that out. We finally got a picture. In the form of a video call with a human. The pilot of the starship in orbit of us, looking as if he were incredibly bored, frustrated, sad. Less happy to meet us and more like he had lost hope at a sight he had seen a million times. He stared back at us like he had just heard a joke for the millionth time, and had no energy to laugh anymore. It took us a bit of fumbling before we were able to speak with him properly, and set up a press conference. I was made to be the face of the conference call. It was a simple setup, a podium and a chair, on which I sat. The Minister of Technology and his team in the background behind me, making sure everything worked. Facing away from the podium towards the screen projector were the press and media apparatus, so they too could ask him questions for their various outlets. The broadcast was made across the whole planet. Cameras on both those in attendance and the video signal we found. This was a monumental occasion. The entire planet was watching now. Hello? Can you hear me? I asked with the microphone. Yeah, I can hear you. Can understand you too. He replied back. The entire world suddenly went into an uproar. Another sentient life form in the galaxy. It was incredible. Is it okay if I ask you some questions first? I said, taking control. Sure, why not? I ain't got shit else to do. His voice was almost as if he was more bored than excited. Well, um, how can you understand and speak our language? I asked him. Curiosity getting the better of me. My homeworld is a species that has, over the millennia, developed over 700 registered languages, with nearly 7,000 separate and distinct dialects between them, counting our planetary colonies and star bases across our home solar system. Consequently, our translation software is very sophisticated. I don't mean to be insulting, but your language was almost trivial. He passed a fake smile at us. No offence, really. It was just a lot easier than I expected. I see. So many... Um, sorry. What are you exactly? What species are you? And whom am I speaking? I asked, to the murmurs of the crowd. I am a human of the Republic of Sol, Corsair pilot under the jurisdiction of the Concordian Accord. The name is Franco de la Morette. Just call me Frank. Yours? He asked standing from his seat to give a salute. Krakan L. V, High Minister of the Diplomatic Corps. I have been elected as our official representative for our meeting. Pleasure to meet you, I said with a smile, showing my sharp teeth. I wish I could say the feeling was mutual, he replied, drinking a strange crystalline liquid from a cup. This caused a murmur and sent the Minister of War to shuffle uncomfortably, whispering something to an associate. Oh. Oh. Um. I decided to deflect that point and continue. On behalf of the Iridian peoples, may I ask what exactly are your intentions towards us? 
My intentions? To you? He looked at us with those strangely adorable tufts of hair above his eyes, raising slightly. Yes. Why are you here? What do you intend to do? I asked again, speaking clear and bold. My intentions? Hmm. How do... Uh, I got it. My intentions are as follows. He loudly cleared his throat. He raised a hand towards the camera, smiled wildly, and began to laugh hysterically. <laughs> he visibly, in an exaggerated manner, took a loud, deep breath and laughed loudly again. <laughs> He laughed more, this time as if his voice was straining now. He laughed so hard he fell out of his seat. Oh god, this is so fucking funny! <laughs> he said, as he audibly rolled around, bashing the floor with his fist in sheer stupid joy. He seemed to calm down momentarily and sat back in his seat with a shifty chuckle. I opened my mouth to speak again and he lost it. Once again, he began to laugh, pointing at the camera. <laughs> this pattern of behaviour continued for a few minutes. I looked around me and noticed similar patterns of both confusion and rage. Eventually, he calmed down and returned to his seat with a smile and waited for a response. Uh, why did you just laugh at us? I asked, flustered. Because your situation is so fucking funny, that's why. In a tragic way, not necessarily in a funny way. But still, funny is funny, he said calmly, now supplying us with his full attention. Care to elaborate, please? I was talking now out of curiosity at this point, more than anything. With pleasure. You are the seventh, count it, seventh alien civilization we have thus far encountered. You are, however, the first of these seven alien species to actually still be alive, or even still sapient, when we first encountered you. So, grats, bro. You made it, he said, and let out a chuckle. Thing is, you ain't got much longer, my brother. See, you suffered the same fate that we went through during the early 20th century. For reference's sake, it is currently the year 2358 for us, and it seems like you're not really doing much about it. See, you are currently facing the single most egregious and unforgivable act of political corruption in your history. Just like we did before the fall of Rome. Half of your government is guilty of treason, the other half of sedition, and unlike us, you have no neutrality, so there's no safety net to fall back on if shit hits the fan. You are also facing the uphill battle with a runaway economy. Because of all the market manipulation your leaders are causing by lobbying various groups, Wages are stagnating, businesses are closing, and soon your farmers will start to feel the pain. You are facing the worst economic catastrophe since the Great Depression. Because your economy is entirely operated by these manipulators, they will fuck off with all the cash leaving you with nothing. No money, no market. No market, no work. Eventually this will trickle to service personnel, which will then affect your very poorly planned farming industry. Which, by the way, has also been aggressively invaded by developers, lobbied by opposing interests, so they can use fertile farmland for other purposes. This brings us to the next point. How because of political and economic corruption, i.e. everyone looking out for their own bullshit, your farming industry is about to collapse, which will ultimately lead to the final nail in the coffin, as it were. No food, no people. All in all, your civilization has exactly what we had so many years ago, only yours has no backup system, no independent platform, and no secondary foundation on which to function. No social security net to catch the fall, no reserves or stockpiles to weather the coming storm. He spoke to us calmly and absolutely. Each time he visited a point, he made us blush, cringe, cradle our heads in our hands or puff our cheeks with rage. The more he spoke, the more humiliated we felt, the more disgusted we felt. We humans, I mean, had safety nets and secondaries because as much as the powers that be hated it, 
We had this whole thing where we liked not being told what to do by people we hated. So, when our collapse happened, we actually had shit to fall back on. The will to survive to carry it, and the corpses of a thousand tyrants to use as a foundation for our rebirth. By now, the whole world was either embarrassed or enraged by this human speaking so calmly. Behind the scenes, high ministers were talking to each other, and working through their data sets available to them. Only to come to the conclusion, this damn human was right. Too right. The more we checked the validity of his arguments, the more we realised we were completely screwed. So, my intentions are as follows. Sit here in orbit and document in every detail I can the inevitable collapse of your civilization and self-extinction of your species. Then, once every last citizen is dead, collect artifacts, documents and anything I can find, handing them to authorities for study. After that, return with a mining crew, crack the planet and strip mine it for resources. Either that, or colonise it ourselves and turn it into a museum or something. I don't know. During this entire process, I will be pointing at you and laughing. But either way, you don't need to care. You'll be dead. He smiled at us and left us dumbstruck. We were left completely speechless, and the more we worked to disprove his statements, the more we sank to despair. The room slowly emptied. The broadcast left to continue with nobody there to officiate it, as we suddenly walked away from the humiliation we just faced. It was, to say the least, a kick in the head. The migraines we felt after this certainly made sure of that fact. Sure enough, as he predicted, a week later our economy began to show signs of falter. The first farmer's revolt we'd had in millennia began shortly after. As he said, everything began to fall apart. Two weeks after the press conference was held, the one where we had realised how badly we had failed, I wandered back into the press room. Everything was still there, still working as we left it, with the human still there, broadcasting himself sitting lazily in a chair, waiting for us to die. I sat in the chair and moved towards the microphone. Fuck you, I said simply, unable to say anything else. Well, that's not very nice. Why are you throwing at me? What did I do exactly? Ain't my fault your economy is failing, is it? Those aren't my farmers striking. Are they? He simply looked back at me with a smirk. Can you do anything? I asked him, slumping over the podium. Nope, not my problem. Yours. He slurped at that strange drink he had before. I grumbled angrily at the response. Nice. Then again, he said. I perked up, paying attention to him immediately. You could always do what we did. You aren't going to like it, but hey, maybe there is hope for you after all. He looked at me with a strange sly grin, as if he were about to do something he wasn't supposed to do, but did not care either way. Go on. How's about I make you a uh, little, um, gentleman's agreement, perhaps? You are definitely not going to like it, but, um, at this point I see no choice, really. If you perform well, I might be persuaded to alleviate your, um, supply issues. At least until you can get back on your feet, he said. Almost too nonchalantly for comfort. I looked at my data sheets, noticing how several embassies were closed, and relations across the board were fracturing. I had no choice at this point. Deal. What do you want me to do? That's the spirit, laddie. I must send you a little package. It's a book. Read it. I translated it to your language for your sake. Read it, implement its rules, and you'll be fine, he said, pressing a series of buttons. A bright light erupted in the room, and suddenly a loud pop noise was heard, as a small book appeared above me, falling into my lap. Hmm. Ain't that a kick in the head, how mankind got its spine back by author unknown? The rules in this book are entirely flexible, designed to cater to an independent mindset. Basic rules to follow when setting up a social safety net, how to properly handle the concept of healthcare, how to properly control the media and see to it they only tell the truth. The methodology is rather barbaric, 
but it worked for us. Why not you? It's entirely optional, of course. You can ignore it. But hey, it ain't my civilization on the line, is it? He spun his chair to the side and resumed doing whatever humans do. I started reading the book I was given, and turned a mild shade of green in the moments of human history array before us. Dear gods! See, there's actually nothing I can really do. Your situation is societal. It's ingrained in your structure. Corruption. Greed. You don't have what we had, but what you do have is still very... deep. I can't just come in here and intervene. What lesson will you learn? If this was a natural disaster, I'd already be down there helping out instead of sitting up here drinking blueberry slurpees. But alas, this entire catastrophe is your doing. I have merely lit the path forward. It is entirely up to you to traverse it. We didn't like it, but it was necessary. The loudest voices in the room needed to be silenced so the smartest voices could be heard. The hypocrites among us had to be shut down to see the truth. The greatest of criminals needed to be hunted down and burned alive, not as a punishment, but rather as a reminder to their successors. Our education system needed a brutal awakening. We nearly broke ourselves. Yet, here I am, in a giant starship. I guess we know what works, and what doesn't. He simply cut the broadcast there, leaving me alone in silence. I read the book, memorised it. After this, I began an inquisition into various members of government, and rallied an underground network of supporters. Using my skills in diplomacy and connections I never thought I needed, I found sufficient evidence. Within days, I convinced the High Chancellor to read the book as well. He agreed. Three months later, we faced a food shortage of severe proportions, but I just barely managed to avoid a complete collapse. The bodies of nearly half of our world politicians, businessmen and high society, now hung as desiccated corpses from lampposts and flagpoles. Every member of the government stood before the world and swore an oath on the gods and upon our ancestors' graves to uphold the will of the people and only the people. Every member of the media apparatus, from the street journalist to the company CEO, was forced at gunpoint to swear an oath to telling only the truth. Big businesses or major companies were made to sign, on pain of bankruptcy and property seizures, a contract that permanently forbade them from engaging in any form of political or social discussion. They were allowed to make money and only make money, and that's all they were good at. So it's all they were allowed to do. A concept of the free market was implemented with restrictions on some critical industries, such as healthcare. The farmers were back to work with no more developers trying to steal land from them. All the while, we worked, painstakingly realising just how close we were to ruin. That giant warship hovered just above us in our moon's orbit. Watching. Waiting. After three months of turmoil, we had staved off catastrophe. Barely. But we would endure. It was later in that year, the High Council was in session, deciding what to do about the encroaching food shortage, noting how rationing was quickly becoming a necessity. A Praetorian walked in the room and interrupted proceedings. My High Chancellor! He bowed his head and put his hand to his chest. A visitor to see you, my Chancellor. A visitor? We are in session. We can't just have rando holy shit. The Chancellor trailed off as... Under guard from a group of Praetorians, Fred the Human walked in the room. The Praetorians towered over him by two feet, and this tiny, adorable creature casually trotted his way into the room, greeting the Chancellor with a smile. Hello there, Greg. Been a hot minute, innit? He just chuckled and smiled as the High Chancellor stood from his seat and regarded the creature standing in front of him. The human sets foot on my home. For what reason? Diplomacy. Come here, friend. I'm more to supply you a little gift, Frank said, and waved the High Chancellor to follow him outside. All of us got out of our seats and followed as well, out of curiosity. Even the camera crews abandoned their posts and followed us outside. 
Out there, the skies were blanketed with warships. Starships and ships of every conceivable make, shape or size. A fleet of a hundred gigantic machines, each one armed to the absolute teeth. The High Chancellor looked at the human with a note of concern. Are you invading us? Is your reason for being here to demand our surrender? Gregorian's tone was less of anger and more of fear. <laughs> there was that laugh again. No, 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 hell no. Supply barge unit A20, landing zone confirmed. Entering ammo. ETA two minutes. A very attractive sounding voice from his radio pack spoke out. Greg, High Chancellor Gregorian Voltaire, it is my pleasure to inform you that after a unanimous vote in the Senate, it has been decided that my fleet, Blackwatch Company, 3rd Legion, has been assigned to the defense of this star system. At least until such an occasion where you are capable of attaining FTL starship travel under your own volition. We will be maintaining the protection of this system and will in no way interfere with any affairs. Unless it is some catastrophic or serious situation, such as a viral outbreak or disaster you cannot handle on your own. Barge Unit 820, touchdown in 10, 9, 8. The voice on the radio spoke again, as a massive half-mile-long cargo freighter began to land in front of us. However, we have heard that you are currently facing a food shortage due to... recent events... In the interest of jump-starting political relations on a friendly note, I have been authorised to supply you with a stockpile of rations, food supply, emergency fuel sources and other relief supplies, to ensure that you weather the coming storm in comfort. Also, in cooperation of our two species, for the greater benefit of us all, I hereby present you the following documents, he said, smiling all the while and handing the Chancellor a folder. But what is this? He asked with wide eyes. Cargo Unit 882 Touchdown. Starting offloading procedures. Three minutes to completion. Stand by. The radio chirped again. As we saw the cargo doors on the ship open. Followed by hundreds of brightly coloured rectangular boxes being offloaded by the ship. Design schematics, technical blueprints and manufacturing specifications for hydrogen tech. The basics we used when we first started colonising our solar system. This should, um, give you a little jump start. In the meantime, this is as far as our interaction goes. If you need us, we will be there. We only lit the path before you. It is up to you to traverse its dangers. I cannot help beyond that. Frank moved away from the group as a small dropship landed in front of us. We look forward to meeting you. If you could, uh, do us a solid, maybe... Hurry up a bit. It's getting lonely up here. The humans smiled at us and flew up and away. The cargo ships finished their offloading procedures and returned to the empty void, waiting for us. For the next ten years we had those warships, sitting quietly just beyond our reach, protecting us from the galaxy's woes, so we could meet them on our own terms. And with that, here we are. We are the Iridium people. We are looking forward to working with you. Thank you, humanity. For giving us the kick in the head we so deserved and desperately needed. Thank you for giving us back our purpose. Thank you for uniting us against the evils of greed and corruption. Thank you for inviting us to the Void.